I'm Josh Berger. And I'm Brian Lomax, and we're your hosts for the Tennis IQ Podcast. This is the show where we go deep into mental performance in tennis and talk about mental toughness at the professional and amateur level. And today's our first episode, and Josh and I thought it would be a great idea to, first of all, introduce ourselves, let you know who we are um, as sports psychology professionals, but also as tennis coaches, um, and then give you a sense of you know, what we think mental toughness is about, what mental performance is like in tennis, and we'll get into some of the different things that are going on in, in the tennis world today. So to begin that process, Josh, let's have you uh, introduce yourself uh, to our new Tennis IQ podcast audience. Hi, everybody. So my name is Josh Berger, and I'm the founder of Tiebreaker Psych LLC, a sports psychology coaching business based in Fairfield, Connecticut. Uh, I grew up as a junior tennis player in Connecticut and noticed that some of the players who I saw at turn- tournaments and competed against had great strokes, yet they couldn't seem to win. When these players competed, they would start throwing the rackets, insulting themselves after missed shots, and would fall apart in high-pressure moments. As I progressed as a junior player, I began to realize that if I could control my own emotions and focus on playing my game during these challenging moments, during some of the bigger moments in a match, then I'd perform a lot better and I'd win more matches. Whether it's college tennis, junior tennis, a 4-5 league, pro tennis, athletes are usually within the same ballpark when it comes to physical skill set and their strokes. But what really what differentiates players and what I've found through, through my own experiences is, is really that mental component. Um, so later on in my tennis career, I, uh, I played in the team at Clark University. And as I progressed as a player while studying psychology, I started to become interested in the field of sports psychology. This interest originally started through reading a couple of popular tennis books um, that deal with the mental side of the game, which are Winning Ugly and The, winner, the Inner Game of Tennis. And I started to realize that ultimately what differentiated tennis players was not necessarily their serves or their forehands, but really the mental side of the game, being in control of one's own emotions. What differentiated tennis players ultimately of a similar level was not the physical side of the game, but rather the mental component. So from seeing this disparity of junior players and collegiate players who struggled with the mental game, as well as seeing some players whose mental strength was among their greatest assets, I decided to dive deeper into the field of sports psychology um, and decided to pursue a master's degree in the field. So right after finishing at Clark, I moved out west to some place a little bit sunnier and moved out to Long Beach, California, where I attended Cal State Long Beach. And I really had a great experience there, certainly learned a lot, and I did my dissertation in mental toughness Uh, within college tennis, where I interviewed 11 uh, head and assistant Division I coaches, um, all about what is what is mental toughness in college tennis. So I found out how they defined mental toughness, what attributes mental toughness consists of, and what are some what are some ways for tennis players to build mental toughness. And really through this experience, I became um, more passionate and more knowledgeable definitely about the mental side of, of tennis, especially as it relates to college, college tennis. Um, but I also gained a greater understanding of mental toughness itself. After graduating from the program, I coached for about six months in Northern California at the Bay Club, at two clubs in the Bay Club um, in Marin, as well as San Francisco. And then in summer of 2018, I moved back to Connecticut. Uh, after moving to Connecticut, I worked for the last two years at Sacred Heart University, which is a Division I university based in Fairfield, Connecticut, where I was the assistant men's and women's tennis coach there. Um, and last fall, I decided to launch Tiebreaker Psych, which is a sports psychology coaching business that helps individual athletes as well as groups focus and improve on the mental side of sport. When I formed Tiebreaker Psych, I decided it took me a little while to figure out exactly what I wanted to name the business. And ultimately I decided on tiebreaker psych because of this concept that Brian and I will talk a little bit more about this 90% concept. And really when it comes down to a high pressure moment in a match, when the match is on the line, in a tennis, in a tennis match that might be the third set or the fifth set, possibly in, in men's tennis at the grand slam level, but generally the third set, 
could be a tiebreaker within the set. And in those moments, w what really differentiates um, differentiates players is the mental component. That really is, quote unquote, the tiebreaker between two individuals. So because of this, that's, that's really where that name came from. And what I found is that at every level, whether it's, um, you know, the junior level or college level from my own playing experience, whether it's um, the collegiate level or the amateur level or, e or even the professional level, players are generally matched up against people within their same playing caliber in terms of the physical part of the game. And players generally train in a similar way and work on the same types of things as it relates to the physical aspect of the sport. However, as it relates to the mental part of the game, that's really, um, that's really a bigger, much bigger difference and is really a much larger variable between tennis players and between athletes. And th this is really where that, that piece comes in because when the match is on the line, it's not generally one player or the other who's serve is stronger, which is why they end up winning. It's generally one player maybe will struggle with handling the pressure more. One player is struggling with their emotion or emotional control in that moment. And that mental side really is what differentiates two people of a similar level when it matters most. So that's, that's through, my, through my own coaching career and through my own playing career, as well as my experience as a sports psychology coach, how I've found that theme of 90% mental to be so important. And I think, you know, first of all, Josh, I'm really grateful that you and I are working on this together and, and a few other projects. And so I, that was great to hear that your, your history through tennis and sports psychology and et cetera. And I think the, the other thing about the 90% mental is if like you buy into that concept, shouldn't, if it's that big of a variable, shouldn't you be more systemic about training it? That, that's the thing. So many, you know, I think when it comes to higher levels of the sport, more and more um, players are, are really taking an intentional approach and working with a professional who, you know, you, you go through each part of the game um, before competing, during competing, as well as after competing, and you develop intentional processes on how to maximize your abilities. But at, at lower levels of the sport, as well as some higher levels, so many people leave that aspect to chance. Um, so the, the idea is not to leave the whole mental component to chance and to have a intentional approach on how to maximize your abilities. Yeah, I 100% agree. Yeah, because and when you say leave it to chance, it's almost like leave it to chance of however you feel that particular day, however you woke up that particular day. And that may not be optimal, right? It's you know? true. And I think what, what sports psychology training really does is it lowers the it's it, it lowers the gap between what your best results are and your worst results because even on your worst day you have something to fall back on you yeah. have a set of skills that you've developed and practiced and that you can refer to when maybe you wake up on the wrong side of the bed when you're not feeling your best any anybody can play great when they're feeling great what really differentiates people is the ability to still perform at a high level when you're not feeling your best, when yeah. maybe something's on your mind, the ability to have the skills to still bring out a high level of tennis on those off days. Yeah, I like how you phrase that because the variability, like, so if, like, if you're not training the mental game, maybe your variability is like this, right? Mm -hmm. From your worst to your best. But if you are, then maybe it's this. And it's a much more consistent, narrow band of performance, which is what you want, right? Maybe it's exactly. really higher scale yeah so i was listening to your history there and i'm like wow josh really had it much more together as a junior player than i did um, <laughs> at least on the emotional side because um you know that that definitely probably was not me <laughs> yeah I, you were probably observing people like me throwing their rackets and getting getting upset on the court um because you know, i started tennis you know when i was six as a family, you know, all we did during the summers was go to a swim and tennis club. And so two things to do there, swimming and tennis, and I didn't particularly like swimming. So I was, you know, uh, on the tennis courts uh, probably eight hours a day. Um, and this was during the boom of tennis in the early uh, to late 1970s. Um, so I started playing year-round when I was 10. Um, started competing in tournaments around that same age. And... Um, Played tennis all through high school and college. 
But I would say that, you know, my mental game really didn't improve until I was in my late 20s, early 30s when I started to pay more attention. And, you know, some of the books that you mentioned are also books that I read. Um, so The Inner Game of Tennis, Winning Ugly. Um, I think a couple other ones that were instrumental was actually um, a CD audio program from a sports psychologist in California named Jeff Greenwald called Fearless Tennis. And that was yep. the first time I'd ever heard of Focus on the Process. And I think it was like 1997 that I, I listened to that and I started to, started to work that into my game. And I feel like, you know, the, my early 30s into the 35s is when I was really experimenting with the mental game. I was my own sort of guinea pig there. I hadn't had a particular academic interest yet in sports psychology. I was really just trying to become the best that I could be, even as an adult player. And I think that the, the concept that made the most sense for me, Josh, was this idea of resetting in between every point like dumping the past and focusing so much on on that next point, the one I could control. Because I noticed that my temper went away when, and I feel like it was not an emotional issue, it was actually a focus issue. I was focused much more on mistakes and what I'd been doing wrong rather than what I needed to do on that next point. And once I started to value the importance of that next point, my emotional game got 100% better. And so this idea of a reset button in between points has is, is made the total difference for me. Um, and at the time, uh, you know, I was working in the software development and testing industry for some large financial companies. And um, I decided after getting some good results as a tennis player you know, at the national level, working on my own mental toughness, um, that this is something I wanted to teach others to do because I felt like, at least at that time, this is like 2008, 2009, no one was really teaching mental toughness or mental skills in a systemic, progressive way. Um, yeah, I, if people went to a sports psychologist at that point, it was probably for a particular issue, but they weren't necessarily learning the skills from the ground up to do it. And that's what I wanted to do. And so I started Performance Extra in late 2009. Um, and I've been working in the, you know, for the most part in the tennis industry, um, certainly worked in a lot of other sports as well. And, and, and is, I really like how you named your, or I didn't, I don't think I knew that story about tiebreaker <laughs> psych and why you named it that way. Um, but performance extra originally started off as tennis extra. And I wanted it, the extra was sort of like the mental side because everybody works on the physical and the conditioning but if you don't have that extra piece focused on the mental side, then you're not really complete. And then uh, I took it to be performance extra so that it could be a little bit more, more generic. Um, so academically, I ended up getting my master's in, at the University of Missouri. Um, and now I'm in the uh, getting close to the end of my doctorate program uh, at the University of, of Western States. Um, I've been coaching tennis sort of off and on through the years. I was coaching tennis a little bit in the 90s. Um, but I've also helped out at Bryant University with their men's and women's program um, programs. I also was at uh, Boston College with the women's team for one season. And uh, in fact, uh, we had a really successful season. It was the first time we'd made the uh, NCAA tournament. In, I think it was like 22 years. Um, wow. So that was, a, that was a really cool journey to, to be on. Um, and now here we are. You know, and we're starting our, our, our Tennis IQ podcast today. And uh, you mentioned the 90% mental thing. We were, we were talking about that earlier after your, your intro um, and, and how important that is. I, you know, y y while we were talking offline, you mentioned Yogi Berra. You know, you want to share that quote because that's an awesome quote. Baseball is 90% mental and the other half is physical. <laughs> I love that, right? Yogi's math isn't necessarily strong, but... I think you and I would agree with that sentiment. Right. Absolutely. And we were saying if, if baseball is 90% mental, then tennis is, is at least that. At least that. You know, it's just I, about there. All by, there's no, uh, oftentimes no, no coach by your side to you know, help you through those tough times. There's no, no way to just sub yourself out and you know, take a 20-minute take a rest. It's, it's just you. It's just you to, to figure out the, the ups and downs of, of the sport on that given day. Yeah, absolutely. I think the other theme that we, we want to be covering as we go through this podcast um, 
is the concept of tennis IQ. You know, because we chose that as our name. You know, when you think of that term, Josh, how do you think of it? What's sort of, you know, your definition of it or, you know, what comes to mind when you think of tennis IQ? Yeah, I think I think of a couple different things. I think of um, one's ability to know themselves and know, number one, their strengths and weaknesses as it comes to their game, right? So maybe a particular shot, maybe it's their conditioning is either a strength or a weakness, whatever their strengths and weaknesses as it relates to their game, but also knowing themselves. So knowing, hey, maybe... You know, maybe I get upset a little bit, um, you know, during certain types of moments. Maybe in the past I've struggled with, you know, dealing with pressure in certain types of situations. Maybe against players that I perceive to be weaker, I tend to play down to that level. And I know we'll, uh, you know, these are different topics we'll talk about. Yeah, but yeah. knowing knowing yourself where you would um, not only the physical aspect of the game, but also how you perform mentally. So I think that's one piece of it, knowing of yourself. I think it's also um, understanding the game enough to be able to understand your opponent and to understand their strengths and weaknesses so that you can um, capitalize on them to give yourself the best possible chance. And also understanding the sport as a whole, um, understanding uh, you know the, the ebbs and flows of a tennis match, how it you know just because things aren't going well within the first five minutes of the match, maybe it's been two games and you start off 0-2 that hey, that doesn't mean it's going to, you know, that I'm going to lose the next 10 games and, you know, be walking off the court after a 6-0, 6-0 loss. That just means that, you know, I maybe had a bad start. Um, so understanding the sport, um, also following, I think, the professional levels of the sport is is a big piece of that at times. And, you know, we'll talk about some of the um, professional examples of tennis, how you know, tennis players are able to pull themselves out of huge holes when they're in them and be able to show that mental toughness during really challenging situations. Um, so to me, it's it's that combination of the knowledge of the self as it relates to tennis, both the physical and mental aspect, um, being able to understand and capitalize on the strengths and weaknesses of your opponent, and also an understanding of the sport as a whole. That's, I think there's, yeah. How do you, um, how do you, conceptualize the um the concept of tennis IQ. Tennis IQ. I think a lot of it the same thing, although I might like if I think of a way when somebody's actually playing, you do have to know about yourself. Um but if we look at say what the player needs to be focused on like when they're actually playing a match. Um you probably need to have more of a focus on what's going on on the other side. Because I think your goal as a tennis player is to make your opponent as uncomfortable as possible. Yep. So your own self-awareness is, like you said, knowing what you're good at and using your strengths to exploit your opponent's weaknesses. So... I guess I'm thinking more about like that external focus on the other side, because what happens when we see breakdowns in mental toughness, where does the focus go? It almost always goes internal. Sure. What's wrong with me? What's, you know, maybe I'm thinking, you know, I'm, I'm focusing too much on my technique. Therefore I'm not getting automatic execution or it could be more critical self-talk. Like, why'd you do that? Um, you're going to lose, right? It becomes much more internal. And I think as players are able to develop everything that you said, but then maybe the ratio of self-awareness to focusing on making the opponent as uncomfortable as possible, like there's a better ratio of that, like maybe 75-25 once you get to you know become a, a great player. Because if you can develop like true self-confidence and belief, you don't need to worry about yourself anymore. Right. Right. And I think, you know, that applies probably more to players who are more finished products. Um, if we're talking to, say, somebody who's between the ages of 11 and 15, well, they may not have a great awareness of their identity as a player yet. So they may still need to be developing some of that. But I think the earlier we can teach people to be more externally focused on the mission 
of making your opponent as uncomfortable as possible, right? To really, in, in essence, break them mentally. Um, the more that you'll take pressure off of yourself, the less you'll criticize yourself, you know? And I think it gives players more purpose on that. I think that, I think that's a huge point that, that awareness of what's happening on the other side of the net, and how to break down your opponent, and how to make them uncomfortable. I see, you know, very often at all levels of the sport that, you know, players are so focused on, okay, what is my best style of play? You know, I, I have a great forehand with a, maybe a weaker backhand. So I'm going to, you know, use my feet and try to run around as many backhands as possible and really try to dictate with my forehand. Okay. That's great. But are you really trying to analyze your opponent's weakness and think about you know, how can you break down their, you know, their weaker side, what, what type of playing style would be most effective against somebody that plays like that? So I, I agree as you get to those higher, you know, higher levels of the game as somebody is, as you said, a more finished product, they're not so worried about, Hey, is my backhand gonna break down today? Right. Is they're, they're more so thinking about how to utilize their strengths to their opponent's weaknesses. Yeah. And it's funny, you also mentioned the knowledge of the sport and you know, you're down 2-0, big deal, right? It's funny, I was watching a match on Saturday and one of the players, she, I was, I was essentially just charting like quality points versus sort of non-quality points. So she starts off the first two games, she wins the first two games and it doesn't play a single bad point, Josh. Like maybe one point was like a neutral point. No, it wasn't terrible. And then the middle of the third game, she makes one mistake. And it went downhill from there. It was right. like every, it was like this, it was almost like her mental toughness was a house of cards in a way. It just, everything collapsed after sort of the one mistake, let the player back in. And she had the other player rattled. And she recognized it, but wasn't able to reset after that one mistake. Ended up losing that game. But even though, you know, she's ahead 2-1, that's a good position. Right. But wasn't able to really come back from that, you know. And I think that that's, uh, that's where that awareness of how the tennis scoring system works, what you're actually trying to win, is, is very important. Because I, I think the tennis scoring system is actually quite devilish. Because it, it tricks you into thinking you need to win every point, but you don't. Um, you know, and you can obviously lose more points and still win the match. You can lose more games in your opponent and still win the match. But as you know, players get really fixated on points. I think, I also think it's interesting, um, as you know, j just as you're saying, uh, when you actually look at the statistics over the course of a match or, or over the course of a year. Um, for instance, at the ATP level, yeah, uh, the yeah. best players in the world, I think Djokovic last year, he won something like 55% of all points played throughout the year. He's yeah. the best player in the world. So knowing that you're going to lose just about 50% of those points on any given day, on any given year. So that ability to be able to lose a point or lose a game and get, you know, or, or a set or whatever it may be, and still be able to reset and come back time and time again is right up there with the most important skills for a tennis player because it's, as you said, that, that devilish scoring system. You're never going to just, you know, w w with maybe a couple exceptions, just, you know, from, from start to finish, just have smooth sailing the whole time. Almost yeah. always there are those ups and downs. And if you can't handle those, you know, those challenging times where you're maybe not playing well or when you're losing, then it's, it's going to be all over pretty fast. So that ability to... You know, when you're in that tough situation, be able to take a deep breath and slow things down a little bit. And say, okay, you know, I was up 2-0 and now I'm, now I'm up 2-1, right? This, you know, maybe, maybe I missed a couple shots over that game where I you know, shouldn't have gone for such an aggressive play there. But hey, you know, this is a long match. I just need to stay focused and remember my game plan and what I'm trying to do on each and every point. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So... So I think that's been a good discussion of like, you know, some of the things that we think about mental toughness and tennis IQ. I want, I want to hear your, you know, maybe some examples that you have in your mind from pro tennis of 
maybe some some great clutch performances or some examples of uh, of mental toughness that you've seen in you know your role as a fan as well as a sports psych professional. Sure, sure. So a couple a couple really come to mind. Um, one was the the 2011 uh, U.S. Open final between uh, Djokovic and Federer, and Djokovic was down down three five. Uh, you know, Federer was serving at 5-3, 40-15, match point. Um, hits a big serve into the Djokovic forehand, and Djokovic just rips the forehand uh, return win. And I think that confidence to, you know, to, to continue going for your shots, even when down in that type of situation, and, and even just that one point. And I think oftentimes you see just it uh, just takes one point to be able to turn around a match. But just the fact that he was confident enough to go for it when, when you know, he was down double match point really was it, was the um, really spurred that that turnaround and, and the ability to that match around and win that match and win win the tournament. Um, another example that I think of is the 2018 U.S. Open um, in the quarterfinals where Nadal played Dominic Team, um, and I remember you know Dominic Team came out in that first set just totally on fire and maybe Nadal was a little bit off but team was just taking it to him every single point and team won the first set six up and you know I think for the vast majority of tennis players when you lose a set six zero, what what is your mindset going to be like is your mindset going to be okay you know that's just one set you know let's put it behind us I think ideally you know we'd love to get to that point but I think you know unfortunately the reality is that most players when you lose a set 6-0 it's it's a hit to the ego you you say you know maybe you come up with an excuse say oh you know it's you know my my strings are too loose today i can't control the ball maybe you say oh this guy's just too good today but nadal he says he somehow was able to reset after that and he came back and won the match in five sets and the fifth set was a tie break 7-6 that really came down to the wire and i think you know, at, w- once they were at that point, once they were at that fifth set tie break, probably if I had to guess what was the different, what the difference maker between them was in the back of team's mind and in the back of Nadal's mind, they both remembered what happened in the start of that match. They remembered that team was on fire and Nadal didn't just give in. He fought back and was able to, um, to, to gain control of the match ultimately and to, to win it, you know, right at the very end. Um, so those are those are two examples that uh, really come to my mind of how two of the the sports top top players uh, were able to take a, a losing situation actually actually and show show some real grit and some real mental toughness in order to turn around matches and and ultimately win. Yeah, I'm glad that you brought up that Nadal team one because um, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but the press conference that Nadal does after yeah. that match. It's like nine minutes long. Um, and I'll put this in the show notes so people can see it. But the first five minutes of that are like sports psychology gold. Like every young player needs to watch the first five minutes of that press conference. Um, because you talked a lot about what you just said, but also um, just the character that it takes to play matches like that. Um, understanding that in the end... You know, whether you win or lose that match, you know, is a little bit, it's out of your control. All you can do is just focus on being the best that you can be in that moment, you know? So, yeah, that was an amazing match. And you're, you're right. It is tough to come back from a 6-0 set, but you have to have the right mindset. Well, maybe that's just a warm-up set, <laughs> you know? Because he, uh, you know, Nadal's obviously very tough on clay, but, you know, one of the years that he won the French Open, he lost the first set to Federer 6-1 in one of those finals and ended up yep. winning in four. Um, you know, and so, uh, you know, sometimes you are a little bit tight when you come out in these matches, you know. I think one of the matches that I, I think about in terms of a mental toughness performance was also in a Nadal match, but he was much younger. Back in 2006 in Rome, he was only 19, and I love showing of some video of the points of that to college players because he's the same age as they are in that video. 
And um, in Rome, back then, there was a, that's a master series event. Back then, those finals were three out of five sets. And this match went five hours and five minutes. So epic. Yep. And about four and a half hours in, Federer is up 4-1 in the fifth. Nadal holds to go to 2-4. And what you see him doing at that point is he's bouncing up and down on the baseline. Super energy. And he's just showing Federer, like, I'm not going away. I'm still here. It's four and a half hours in. I've got a lot of energy and, and a lot of fight. Um, and I think that was one of the things that differentiated Nadal from other players back then is it's not that he didn't respect Federer, but he wasn't necessarily intimidated by him. You know, he felt like he could go toe-to-toe with Federer. And so after he does that bouncing up and down, he breaks Federer in that next game. Yep. Then the match ends up going into a, a tiebreaker in the fifth, and Nadal's doing the same thing before the tiebreaker. And you see in the camera, Nadal's bouncing up and down, and the camera pans to Federer, and he's got sort of this glassy-eyed look on his face because he actually had two match points uh, in the previous game, and he made quick errors on them. And I always ask students, all right, who do you think won this tiebreaker? Because it's very obvious from the body language, um, you know, who's going to win it at that point, and it's Nadal. And I think what I like about that is we all recognize the artistry and the, the talent and the ability of a Roger Federer. Not that he, you know, he obviously he's worked very hard to get where he is. Um, but there's, you know, there's sort of a, an aura about the guy. And where Nadal kind of has more of a, a grinder style of play, maybe a little less aesthetically pleasing to most people, but um, he hangs in there with that, with, you know, with, with Federer. He actually makes Federer extremely uncomfortable, especially back then. I think he, his game back then, because he could cover more court, um, I think was particularly annoying to Federer, yep. you know, getting the ball up high and that one-handed backhand and just doing that over and over again. And his, you know, Federer's backhand wasn't quite the same. I think it's better now that he's using a bigger head as well. Um, so those are the, you know, what I've been impressed with uh, Nadal about that. And then he was doing that at such a, at such a young, young age. Um, no, I, I remember uh, Nadal, you know, from, from an early age, I mean, obviously he came in and won, won the French open at 18 in his first, you know, first time playing, playing the tournament but um i think what led to his dominance really in, in the head-to-head -head between him and uh in between him and federer was that ability to really identify his own strength which was was his forehand which he you know could hit with more topspin than anybody yeah. and that ability to hit it you know that high bouncing shot up to up to federer's weaker side and really break down that stroke as you said earlier you know really that ability to make somebody uncomfortable and to, you know, it's not only Nadal playing his best, but it's, he's found a way to make Roger, um, you know, play, play in a style of tennis where he's uncomfortable and he has to hit the shot that he doesn't like over and over again. Yeah. I think, you know, even from a young age, and he, he also played a little bit differently back then. He was, you know, he's definitely more of a grinder. He stayed even further back behind the baseline, not just on the server turn, but really throughout the point. Yeah. And, it would be, you know, it was the type of player that Federer, as well as other other top players, had never really seen before. Um, so yeah, I, I uh, that match, and you know, I just from watching those highlights, it it, it shows. I mean, going into a, a tiebreak like that, if, if one if one player is you know happy to even be there because they've come back, and the other one feels that you know this match should have been over five minutes ago or you know a set ago or whatever it may be it's those two players are going in with totally different mindsets however they're they're totally just based on the score on paper totally even at that point so it just yeah. shows the, the difference that that mindset really makes yeah and i think you know this is probably a theme that we'll touch on throughout you know our podcast season your ability to just accept where you are and not worry about how you got there Yep. You know, because I'll often ask a player, all right, let's say you're going to play this person, and, I, and I'll guarantee you, you're at five, you get to five all in the first set. Would you be happy? And of course, they'll say, yeah, I'll be happy. So right, let me change the scenario. Let's say you were up 5 1. Now it's 5 5. 
Are you still happy? <laughs> right. You know, the idea is, can you feel the same no matter how you got there? Absolutely. And I think, I think that, that concept of mindfulness and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, being aware of what's going on around you, but really coming back to that present moment is so important where you're not constantly thinking back to the past and thinking, oh, you know, I, I was at 5-1 and then those last four games were horrible. Um, so thinking in the past or thinking about the future, like, you know, what's going to happen if I lose this set? If I lose this set, I'm down set. Is there any way I have enough in the tank physically to come back from that? What are my parents going to think? What are my coach going to think if I lose this? Not thinking about anything in the future, not, you know, focused on what just happened in the past, but really, you know, okay, this is the score right now. This is what's happening in front of me right now in this moment. So that concept of mindfulness really, to me, makes makes a huge difference to, um, you know, when, when maybe you're in a more frazzled mindset because of what just happened over those past few games, you can come back to that present moment and really focus on what do I have to do right now? Yeah, and I think that's where, you know, that time in between points is so critical. Many of us don't even give a thought to it. You know, it's more of an afterthought, but that I think is, is a really critical time. So that we don't slight the WTA, let's talk about some women's mental toughness performances. What, you have any examples there that you are, you know, you like? Yeah, well, one example is actually uh, last year's U.S. Open. I know we have mm -hmm. a lot of U.S. Open examples, and uh, we've got the U.S. Open around the corner, which I know we'll talk a little bit about. But uh, last year in the final, um, Bianca Andreescu, she was up, uh, I believe, 5-1 in, mm -hmm. in that second set. And Serena Williams, who you know many would say is the greatest of all time or um, you know certainly a, a legend of the sport, is uh, you know came roaring back and uh, brought, brought that match even, I believe, to five all. And what did she do? Did, did Bianca Andreescu say, uh-oh, you know, I can't, I can't handle it at this point. This is, you know, this is over. And then Serena wins 7-5 and wins the third set. No. What, what ended up happening was she was able to regain that composure and ended up winning those next two games. So to me, it showed, you know, just because you go from 5-1 to 5-5 or just because, you know, something bad has happened, you know, right before, the, the, the time is the time there's no time like the present to really turn that around. And she was able to, you know, she got off to a you know really hot start in that match. And then, you know, just because she took a dip those few games, she was able to regain that composure and ultimately close it out. And I mean, I think we every I think every tennis player knows how challenging closing out a match can be. Yeah. Um, so that ability to close out a match when things weren't going your way just a few games before is very impressive, especially when it's in uh, the finals of the U.S. Open. So to me, that was a, a recent example from the WTA Tour that was very impressive. Yeah, and I think, um, if I'm not mistaken, doesn't she practice meditation? Doesn't, isn't that does. sort of to your point of mindfulness? And I think she has pointed to meditation as being a, a big contributor to her success. Yes, she is. She has spoken very openly about um, meditation, mindfulness, as well as um, visualization as being important to her and her her rise. I mean, over the last you know year and a half, two years, she went from being outside of the top hundred to being um, a Grand Slam winner in a very very short amount of time. So I think um, she is somebody um, who you know is a is a great great example of how important that the mental side of the game is. And that, you know, in training, training the mental side intentionally can make a, a huge difference. Yeah. Well, let's hope that her physical health, you know, keeps her on the court, you know, because it seemed like that's probably the area she's struggling with the most are physical injuries. Yep. Yep. Last year, yeah, definitely had to deal with some. And, but it was, it was remarkable that um, during the summer after coming back, you know, she, she won um, the Masters up in Canada and then, you know, won the, the U.S. Open right after that. So, as you said, you know, hoping that her physical health can keep her on the court because when she's on the court, she's you know, truly a special player. And fun to watch. Absolutely. You know, there's a lot of variety there, and it's it's it's, it's not sort of the same, uh, you know, just metronomic game that some players have where they're just kind of hitting the ball back and forth, right? It's true. A lot yeah. of variety. When I think of, uh, and I'm going to be dating myself here, Josh, uh, when I think of mental toughness on the women's side, like the 
one of the mentally toughest players I can remember, it's Monica Sellis. And her play, you know, late 80s, early 90s, I've never seen a player go after a ball, every ball, <laughs> the way she did it. Now, have you ever seen her play or watch any videos of her? Highlights. Highlights, yeah. Yeah. And if you can go sort of back before she, the stabbing, because she really wasn't the same after coming back. But, um, you know, just somebody who was so clutch. So even in, you know, I think there was one French Open final where it went maybe 9-7 or 10-8 against Jennifer Capriati and just ripping balls at the end of the match, you know, going for lines and she's hitting two, two hands off both sides. And, you know, if it hadn't been for that incident where she was stabbed, you know, in Germany, we'd probably be having a very different conversation about who might have been the, the greatest player, you know, of all time. But I think, you know, what I'll, I'll uh, maybe what we can do is in our show notes, put some uh, links to some of these matches that we have highlighted today so that, uh, you know, listeners and watchers can go back and, and see some of this. Absolutely. I think I think that would be a great way to, you know, to put some of these in context. Maybe they're familiar with, uh, you know, some of these matches, but um, being being able to, to watch those highlights, I think, really, really demonstrates how, how impressive some of these um, comebacks were and just some of these matches in general and you can you know being able to watch some of that body language yeah. as we talked about is also also important there for sure so how about we transition to kind of what's going on in the tennis world today because you mentioned earlier you know hopefully the u.s open is is coming up um you know but we've had some um setbacks yeah over the last few days right though the uh china part of the tour has been canceled davis cup final atp cup finals have been canceled the city open in washington has been canceled you know as of now the western and southern is still on um which will be in new york yeah exactly it's still at the same site as the u.s open um you know what are some things that you're seeing and and thinking about as we go into this you know for you know from a, a player's perspective and a mental skills perspective yeah, I mean, I think they're, uh, as you said, I think, uh, you know, we're all hoping, obviously, that the U.S. Open will be able to you know, move ahead as, as scheduled. Um, over the over the summer, there was, uh, you know, unfortunately, there was a, a tournament, the Adria Tour, mm. that took place um, in Europe. And, the you know, do I would say, frankly, due to a lack of, a lack of uh, precaution and, and safety and, you know, really making safety the priority. Um, a number of players ended up testing positive Djokovic being one of them. And as well as uh, Victor Troisky, uh, Grigor Dimitrov and, um, and Borna, Borna Toric. Yeah. Um, so I think as well as some of their coaches and uh, Djokovic's wife. So I think, you know, that, that should be a learning example. That should be, an example uh, that really demonstrates how important it is to make safety the the highest priority, which it definitely seems that the U.S. Open is doing. Um, there, I know there's it's going to be played with no fans. It's going to be you know players will have a smaller entourage and smaller support staff around them than they're used to. Um, even some of the draws are smaller. Um, so it really seems like the U.S. Open, even you know players having to stay in certain hotels. I've heard. Um, so it really seems that the U.S. Open is doing a good job in terms of taking a lot of precautions and uh, really making safety the number one priority as they as they should, which I think is needed during these times, especially since, you know, we've seen the U.S. is really, you know, still having lots and lots of daily cases and deaths. Um, so I think for players to feel safe and secure coming to play at the U.S. Open, that needs to be the case. Safety has to be the number one priority, um, which it really seems like the U.S. Open is making that the, the top priority. But I think it's also, um, you know, challenging when um, we talked about how important staying present is. If you're, if you're constantly thinking about the future, thinking about the what ifs as you're playing, as you're competing, you're, you're most likely not going to be at your best. Yeah. So if you're out there competing and you're thinking, you know, what if, that locker room I was in wasn't properly sanitized. 
what if those people around me, you know, what if one of them has COVID? What if, you know, there right now there's a lot of uncertainty. And there's a lot of what ifs. So I think because of that, it's, it frankly can be tough to stay in the moment and tough to really stay focused on playing your best tennis. I think also the fact that so many players, yes, yeah, there've been some exhibitions some smaller tournaments, but so many players haven't played a, you know, a, an ATP match or WTA match since February. Yeah, I think that's going to be one of the major things yep. is because we both know, I think one of the last things that comes back is your ability to kind of manage yourself through a match. Absolutely. Right. And the strokes come back pretty fast and, and all of that. But um, yeah, can you play a tour level match and, you know, can it happen that quickly? And like you said, we really haven't seen the top players do that. Um, you know, I just was reading this morning at R Renee Stubbs, who is a commentator for Tennis Channel and has her own podcast, uh, reported today that Djokovic has ordered a case of U.S. Open balls to be sent, and he's been filmed practicing on hard court. So um, it would appear that may maybe he's going to come. You know, I, I don't think he had necessarily committed. Um, you know, Nadal still is being filmed practicing on clay. <laughs> Hasn't been practicing on hard courts. So, you know, one would have to speculate that he may not be coming. And there's, it's also, I mean, there's also such a short amount of time between yeah. the US Open and between that clay court swing starting, you know, which includes the French Open. So it's, you know, I think some players are going to pick and choose yeah. between that hard court swing and between the clay court swing. Yeah, I mean, so if you were to play the Western and Southern the U.S. Open, Madrid, and Paris, that's like five straight weeks right. of high-level tennis. And I'm not sure everybody can manage that, especially I, the time off, right? I don't, think how, I don't think many players can. I mean, I think uh, they, you know, they, they might be risking an injury. I also think that switch from hard court to clay is yeah. you know, really challenging where you're coming from a really fast surface off, you know, to immediately to a surface where you have to really, you know, be more patient, play longer points, grind more. So I think between all these back to back to back grand slams and masters paired with that change of surfaces is, is going to be really challenging. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, I, 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 a thing I wonder about more for the U S open is, you know, what's the field going to look like? Yep. Um, you know, how strong will it be? You know, will it end up being a, you know, it could actually turn out to be like a wonderful opportunity for somebody to get their name in a record book. You it's know, true. It would it's not true. be because obviously Federer is not playing. Um, and uh, yeah, we don't know which European players will choose to come. I guess the good news is um, uh, Department of Homeland Security is not going to force tennis players to quarantine. So that is good news. That is good news. And uh, at the moment, I think the Madrid tournament. Is also not forcing, although I think cases are now rising again in Spain. So that, that might change. Yeah. I think, uh, no, I think it'll be interesting to, to see what that field looks like. I think, as you said, it could be a great, great chance for, um, you know, for, for some, a player to get into the history books that maybe on a, on a year where Federer, Nadal, and Djokovic are all playing and are all at their best. Yeah. It's over this last, you know, really 15 years it's been it's been almost impossible for players i mean there's been you know with with a few exa a few um exceptions it's been you know so tough for any other players to to win a major so i mean one one thing i'm thinking about frankly is um at least on the men's side it's been a long time since there's been a a american to win a grand slam as well as american to win the us open i believe since andy roddick in 2003 if I recall, so. yeah. So maybe I mean there are some up and coming Americans um, that you know maybe one of them, um, you know they're, they're used to the hard courts, they love playing um, in the U.S. Obviously there won't be fans around, but still you know in a comfortable environment, maybe maybe one of them I, um, could could really break through. Um, you know, so certain I know Francis Tiafo unfortunately tested positive for COVID, but if he you know, if he can come back. Yeah. In time, also, you know, Taylor Fritz, um, certainly uh, have my eye on. So there's, you know, there's a number of 
of young Americans, both on the men's and women's side, that I think, uh, you know, on the women's side, American women have had more success and had there been more um, champions, um, with, you know, Cannon winning recently and um, among others. So, um, yeah, I think it'll be interesting. I think it's a great opportunity. I think if players can, you know, sort of view it as an opportunity yeah. rather than threat or something, you know, I think that's that's one of the keys during these unusual times to, to view it as, hey, this is a great opportunity for me rather than this. Eh, I'm not I'm not sure about this as much as you can shift that mindset. I think the better. Yeah. And I guess, you know, let's hope that it all comes through because then I think, you know, we often talk a lot about the top players, but at other levels of the tour, you know, um, people have to play to make money. Right. And with these events getting canceled and so forth, you know, it becomes very hard to to sustain yourself out on the tour, whether you're you know on the men's or, or the women's side of things. So that's certainly something that, you know, the both of the tours have to be aware of is, you know, this the the uncertainty for their players and the mental health um, implications of that. Um, you know, and so I know that um, at least the ATP tour has um, some resources for players to, uh, to help them out with that. Uh, I was looking at this uh, the other day, you know, so they have a, uh, every player can get a premium account on Headspace for meditation and, and things like that. Um, and they also have uh, access to um, counseling services uh, with this um, firm in the UK that was started by a former Arsenal uh, football club, um, defender Tony Adams. And um, so it looks like some actually really wonderful counseling services that you can get if you're having some issues with, you know, with mental health. And that's obviously become a, a big part of uh, tennis, you know, with Marty Fish and some other players who have struggled with some of these things, you know, and that can be a topic that we discuss over, uh, over a few episodes. So, um, so Josh, anything else that you want to, you know, talk about with respect to, you know, what's going on in the game today? I mean, I think, you know, I think it's it's such an unprecedented time. I think uh, what's really important here is for for everybody, um, but for tennis players of all level, whether they be junior players, whether they be college players who maybe aren't aren't so sure about you know what comes next in terms of this season, you know, professional levels, amateur uh, amateur players, whoever whoever uh, whatever level of tennis you play. I think it's important to be adaptable right now, to understand that there, you know, things might be canceled, to understand that when you do play, things will be different, um, both in terms of safety, but also in terms of, um, you know, maybe having parents around or fans around. So I think, you know, being adaptable during these times is really going to be the key. And I think those who are able to be adaptable and are able to adjust to things moving fast and things changing will really ultimately be the ones who are the most successful. What about you? What do you think? What, what else is on your mind during, during this time? What, what are you really thinking about? I mean, I guess I, I, I like everything you just said. I think that there's a ton of uncertainty. I, I think as the players, I don't know, even as I've gotten back onto the court myself, once I'm kind of on the court, I'm, I feel like I'm back and I'm not really worried so much about all that other stuff. So I feel like the players, once they're actually out there, will be fine. Yep. Um, I think, you know, there will probably be some adjustment to, yeah, all the different protocols that go on. But at some point, whether we like it or not, this is that's going to be a bit of our normal for the next several months or if not, maybe even the next year or so. And I feel like, you know, Players are resilient and young enough that they can, they can, they can handle that. It's, uh, I guess we just all need to figure out what are the best ways for us to be responsible and stay healthy and stay safe and protect everybody that's around us, not just our, ourselves, right? Because um, I think one thing that we want to see from our top players is you know, some leadership by example, you know, which perhaps we didn't see enough of that, in, as you alluded to, that, that Adria tour. Um, we didn't see enough of that leadership by example, and I think we, we could get more of that. Um, so maybe we will, and, and, and hopefully we do. So I guess that's, that's what I'd like to really kind of focus on is, are these top players going to um, 
show us how it should be done because um, they do in so many ways. Can they do it when it comes to something as uh, globally important as, you know, COVID-19? Absolutely. I mean, I think, um, you know, we see, we see now the uh, professional baseball restarting. Um, the NBA is, you know, restarting in just a couple of days. And, uh, but really the U.S. Open will be one of the first major uh, sporting events. Yeah. Really you know, up there with the biggest and up there with, you know, the first. So I think this is a, a great example or a great chance for tennis to showcase that we're doing all the all the right things. We're, you know, taking all the precautions. We're, we're putting safety first. And as you said, for um, for professional tennis players to really lead by example and to show, you know, that there is a safe way to play tennis. Um, tennis has been shown to be, um, you know, that certainly among the most, safe sports right now during during this time it's, it's a naturally socially distant sport i know there's been research that has shown that tennis is up there with um the safest activities so uh i think this is a great a, a great opportunity for tennis players and the really the sport of tennis to to showcase that um that they can do that, that they can play the sport at a high level in a, in a very safe way in the safest way possible so i'm excited yeah. uh, to really see it happen yeah, me too. And let's uh, keep our fingers crossed that everything goes well and all the way through through Paris and then and the French Open. Yep. Very cool. Well, that's our show for today. Uh, I want to thank you for tuning in. Um, we'll put more in the show notes about some of the things that we highlighted as part of uh, our discussion. Um, you can subscribe to our show on your platform of choice. Um, so Tennis IQ Podcast. If you have feedback want to send us an email or a question, you can email us at tennisiqpodcast at gmail.com. Or if you want to use Twitter, use the hashtag tennisiq and we'll respond there. Um, we'll also be putting these um, podcasts on YouTube. So subscribe to our YouTube channel, Tennis IQ Podcast. And we will uh, see you in a couple of weeks for our next episode.